Hello. <laughs> I'm coming to you today looking like crap. Looking like a bag, just like a whole sleeping bag, because my emotional support blanket matches the colour of the... I just look like an amorphous blob today, which feels appropriate, because that's how I feel inside, spiritually, emotionally, mentally. Physically. I look like what my granny used to look like when you would go in and she'd go, I've had a day. That's how I look. So that that's the kind of place we're at. So this week in my life, <laughs> I, well, I don't even know if it was this week, over the last week and a half, I interviewed for a job, which was quite stressful, but it was a sort of positive process. Didn't get that job, so that's fine, but then had to sort of mentally face going back to the search. Um, what else happened? I went into just a bit of a weird mental place, that was fine. And then last night I saw a mouse in our house and that's not a good situation because my dad has a very, very big fear of mice, like a proper phobia, like he can go into a catatonic state if he sees a mouse. Side note, my dad also has a pacemaker and a degenerative heart condition, which means that he shouldn't really get stressed. So both of those things combined is just not a great time. We think that they're not nesting here because we don't have any droppings or any evidence in the house. I've just seen it twice. So about three weeks ago I saw something sort of black dart out of the corner of my eye, thought it was like a spider, and then we didn't see anything for the rest of the like night. We just kept a complete eye out and I thought, oh you know what, this happens sometimes. I think out of the corner of my eye a piece of my hair has like fallen and I've just thought it was something on the carpet. Happens to me all the time. And this is about three weeks ago, so we brushed it off. And then last night, the same thing happened again, but we were watching TV, like sitting at the table, and again, it was out the corner of my eye, I saw something darting, but I was a lot more sure about it that time. I was like, I think it's a mouse, and I got quite in a bit of a state. And then we had a mum over, she's in our bubble, she also had her jab, so we, so we felt fairly safe, had all the doors open so the mouse could run out, and we were tipping up the sofa, it wasn't coming out. And then of course, once mum left, I, you know, kept a laser focus on where I'd seen it. And then while dad was making his tea in the kitchen, I saw it run back into his room and I was like, ah. <laughs> Which was nice actually, because at least I wasn't lying. Like I felt like I was the girl who cried a mouse because nobody else had bloody seen it. So I thought, oh my God, I've gone round the bend. Like this isn't real, but it's real. And then we talked to the girls upstairs in the flat upstairs and they've seen mice and they've got droppings and stuff and they've heard scratching. So we think that the primary nest is in the upstairs flat um, and it just occasionally comes to visit us, you know, grace us with its presence. So we've been dealing with that, which has been not fun. And this is such a long intro, I just feel like I need to... This video is late as well, obviously, as it always will be, and it's fine, it's fine. I've just had a bit of a week, is what I've had. So I just wanted to share. <laughs> So anyway, what is today's video? What do I have in the old schedule? Oh yeah. Same <laughs> old Wow. So today we'll be continuing with the series that I started, which is my favourite first watches bi-monthly. I don't know if that's how you say it. Every two months. Could just on that. Every two months you will get a new video like this where I take you through all of my favourite things that I have watched and discovered for the first time ever, and I'm doing this because as a sort of filmmaker, aspiring creator in the industry, if they'll ever let me in. Um, I obviously want to watch as many things as possible, find new creators, find new movies, find new TV shows. I'm on a general quest to, you know, watch more new things and be a bit more tuned in to the current landscape instead of just clinging to my old nostalgic faves, which I am want to do quite often because they're nice. So yeah, every two months I'm going to take you through my top 10 favourite first watches in that two month period and give you some stats about how I've been doing. Not gonna lie, not great across March and April. Um, in total, only 14 films watched between March and April and only nine of those were films that were new. So... Not ideal, not ideal. And obviously I'll take you through the new ones in the top 10 section, but for anyone who was curious, the re-watches in March were Whiplash, uh, Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, Extended Edition, and then the re-watches in April were Lord of the Rings, The Two Towers, 
Midsummer and Promising Young Woman because it came on Now TV and you should absolutely watch it and also watch my video on it because I like that film a lot. So to break it down per month, in March I had four new watches, two re-watches, and in April I had five new watches and three re-watches, and that's all for films, not including TV at all there. Compared with January, February, it's sort of the same. In Jan, Feb I watched 19 films and 16 of them were new, so obviously I watched a higher ratio of things that were new in Jan, Feb but sort of the ballpark figure is the same and I gotta, I gotta do better. <laughs> I also gotta stop rambling and just get into some reviews, tell you what I've been watching, what I've been liking. So the first one I want to talk about that I watched right at the beginning of March, and this literally feels like centuries ago, was Raya and the Last Dragon, which obviously was meant to be Disney's sort of big release of the year and cinemas. Where are they? Where are the cinemas? So we had to watch that at home, online. I did enjoy it. I, I mean, I'll always enjoy that Disney formula of, you know, here's a quest, here's some beautiful animation, here's a fun animal sidekick. I did really love the animal companion in Raya and the Last Dragon. His name is Tuk Tuk and he is beautiful. He's like a cross between like a puppy armadillo thing. I love him. Like he is a friend but also transport and like a king. Who is doing it like him? He is practical and fun. Red and Last Dragon does, you know, conform to his Disney ideals and it has this sort of nice message about coming together and putting your past behind you. We are in this sort of fantasy world in which the different factions of, of the fantasy land have sort of split and obviously the sort of fantasy land takes inspiration from Asian and Southeast Asian folk tales and you know lore and all of the design of it is really really gorgeous I can't speak to how accurate it is and like what the representation is like but um they definitely did try to sort of give it that feel of authenticity and it looks beautiful and um I really did enjoy that story of like let's all come together because like I know it's cheesy there's a doorbell great <laughs> this video is so chaotic like i know it is cheesy but it does it doesn't fail to get me especially you know in recent years we have had quite a fractured political climate uh, i do sort of enjoy that very nice disney message where it's like let's all be friends even though it does oversimplify because we don't want to be friends with shitty people if you know what i mean <laughs> The next film I have on my list is Judas and the Black Messiah, which I sought out because it was nominated for a Best Picture and Daniel Kaluuya was getting all of the awards as he should have. In this film he plays Black Panther leader Fred Hampton, who was assassinated by the police at the age of 21, which is insane to me because I knew about Fred Hampton, I knew about his legacy and all the things that he did and the impact that he had on the Black Panther Party, the Black Panther movement, the civil rights movement in general. And it's crazy to me that he was 21 when he was killed, so two years younger than I am now. Just insane. Obviously he wasn't a kid, but like, I still feel like a child. So I mean, it's just crazy to me how young he was and how much he did in the time that he had and how much he would have gone on to do had he been allowed to. Incredible, incredible performance by Daniel Kaluuya. I wasn't blown away by um the rest of the film in the way that I was expecting to be I think I was expecting a little bit more it did sort of have that biopic feel and I think that is a very hard thing to do well like a biopic because you are sort of constrained in a lot of ways um and that's such a familiar story but the performances from both Daniel Kluwer and Lakey Stanfield are really incredible and their chemistry is really really fun to watch so I would definitely recommend seeking it out for that reason but I don't really see it as being one that I'll return to that much. The next thing on my list is Shadow and Bone which I know came out sort of very recently in April but they're sort of ranked in sort of order of what I want to rave about so like my top thing is going to be at the end of the video so the next thing I have to talk about is Shadow and Bone, which for the most part I really enjoyed. I reread the book Shadow and Bone so that I could, you know, <laughs> remember what was going on and feel comfortable in the world. I think I should have also reread Six of Crows, and I think I would have done had I given myself enough time, um, because the elements that I enjoyed of the show the most were definitely the parts of the Six of Crows characters. Like those were the parts that just sang for me, and I was like, yes. And I don't know if that's because the series. I just much prefer that series. I think I do. I do love a good heist. I do love a good sort of. Amsterdam inspired environment and a sort of gritty grimy casino 
vibe. Um, it is more appealing to me than like Alina's sort of chosen one narrative. But I don't know if those parts of the show stood out to me more because I just reread Shadow and Bone. So the Shadow and Bone elements felt quite familiar to me and I was like, oh yeah, I know what's going on here. Like I know what's going to happen. Um, so I would want to reread Six of Crows and then maybe watch it again, give it a second pass, see how I feel about it. But for the most part I enjoyed it. I thought that the script was good, there was no sort of cheesy lines. I mean like I know that it's not perfect, it's not gonna really capture the imagination, like it's not gonna be one of those Netflix shows like Stranger Things or something like that that really sort of captures everybody. I think it is a sort of thing that you have to really be into that sort of thing if you're gonna be into Shadow and Bone if that makes sense. But I like the design of the world, I think it was well constructed, I think they merged the two series really well. Um, I will want to reread Six of Crows so that I can see See that. The only quibbles that I have seen that are, you know, worth mentioning is that the inclusion of making Alina half shoe, so mixed race, half Asian, um, in the show, she's not that in the book, and I think people were excited for that representation, but the way that they've handled it, they've included a lot of characters uh, referring to her by different slurs, and, you know, there's racism in the show, and I don't know if that's um, done in the way that um, is sensitive. I know it's hard to do racism sensitively, like how do you do that, but um, I have seen some critiques from sort of own voices reviewers that have said that that was a little bit not great for them. But for the most part I think it was a solid adaptation, it definitely gave me the vibes that I felt reading the book and I would be looking forward to a season two if they are gonna do one. The next thing on my list is Palm Springs, which is a movie on Amazon Prime with Andy Samberg and Chris Dina Malotti, is that her name? I could have butchered that, I'm really sorry. <laughs> Palm Springs is a really sweet, really fun film that I watched at the exact right time. I mean, it is a perfect sort of lockdown film because it is taking that concept of Groundhog Day, but it has a little bit of a new twist on it where there are now two people in this Groundhog Day situation and they have to sort of live out the same day together and they get really sick of each other and they're arguing and one of them is quite complacent and just is like, well, this is our life now, we have to just make the best of it. And the other one is like, no, we deserve better. We should try and get back to our real lives and break out of this cycle. And it's a really fun film and I know they're going for something a little bit deeper that it is like a big metaphor for marriage, you know, being stuck day after day with the same person and do you want to commit to this one person every, every single day or is that too much? Like you need other things in your life to fulfill you la la. And I don't know if it quite hits that like emotional resonance that I think it's going for but I think it is a really sweet and charming film. It's so endearing, the lead performances are what makes it um, and also a very fun cameo, not cameo but you know side performance from J.K. Simmons who is hilarious in it and his chemistry with Andy Samberg is really funny and there is a scene where they both go on like a massive bender and that was something that I didn't know that I needed until I saw it on screen and it was perfect um, so I really would recommend this film if you need like a pick-me-up night in film this is definitely one for that. The next thing I have on my list is Dairy Girls and yes this list has like got 10 things in it because I'm also including TV shows I don't think I even have 10 films that were my favourites because I only watched like nine new ones anyway in the months of March and April so I will be filtering in TV shows as well. But yeah I watched Dairy Girls for the first time this month. It wasn't hard, it's not very long uh, which is sad. I don't know why I thought it would be like at least 10 episodes per season, I just had that in my head. But it's not, it's six per season and they're only half an hour each and it went too quickly and I loved it. It was just as good as everyone says it is. I loved it just as much as I thought, as I, thought I would. Um, so very much looking forward to season three and I don't know what else to say about it that hasn't already been said. It's hilarious, it's charming, it's beautiful, it's um, these girls in Ireland coming of age against the sort of troubles. It's about friendship and the sort of political goings on at the time and family and it's just scripted so cleanly like there was not a wasted line. Seamless, beautiful, loved it. My next favourite was Love and Monsters, a new Netflix film starring Dylan O'Brien which again was sort of very timely to watch uh, sort of in this weird pandemic period because we follow Joel who in the like zombie weird creature apocalypse, they're not zombies, it's like 
some weird chemical fell down from the sky from like a bomb that went off and then basically this weird chemical turned the animals to go all weird and mutation-y and then they attack people and they're huge now. So Joel has been in this bunker for like seven years hiding with his crew um, you know trying to survive and he finally decides that he wants to emerge into the dangerous outside world and track down an ex-girlfriend that he hasn't seen in seven years and that he hasn't stopped thinking about and he loves her so much and so he makes this parallel journey across the outside to go and find her and on his way he meets a beautiful dog who I loved incredible dog like 10 out of 10 dog content I love the dog I love the dog so much and also if you're a dog lover like me I will tell you now the dog doesn't die and no that's not a spoiler I need to know before I go into a film that if it has a my camera shut off and I might do it again so We'll see. We'll see. We'll see how this goes. As well as the design of the world being really incredible, the lead performance by Dylan O'Brien is also great. I mean, he's on his own for the majority of the film. I mean, he meets people on the way and he's got a dog, but he really has to sort of, uh, what's the word? Um, carry the film. Um, his lead performance really does carry the film. I'm sorry if the continuity sucks because my camera keeps dying. <laughs> but yeah, I can't think of a better time for this film to come out. It's literally about somebody entering into the dangerous outside world in order to pursue someone that they love that they haven't seen for a very long time. I mean, did the screenwriter have 2020 vision? Oh, that was horrendous. I'm very sorry for that. Right, I'm gonna try and speed through these now because my camera is pissing me off. So the next favourite I want to talk about is Mulholland Drive. And how the hell do we talk about Mulholland Drive? It is so typical of me to only become a lynch stan after I left film school. Like, how annoying is that? I could have had so many cool conversations with some of my favourite lecturers about David Lynch. But I decided not to watch David Lynch film until I left film school. Stupid, stupid worms for brains. I know that David Lynch has a sort of weird <laughs> reputation and what I would say is that don't let the stands, specifically the male stands of David Lynch, deter you from watching David Lynch films because I met so many David Lynch film fans at film school and that made me like so much less inclined to watch David Lynch's work because these people were so annoying about it. But I promise you if you put in the effort, if you put in the effort for David, the complexity and the texture of his films and his work and his voice will reward you. And before I watched Mulholland Drive, I did David Lynch's masterclass on that, you know, masterclass website that you always get ads for on YouTube. And he is just such a fascinating person and it made me want to watch his films like times 10. I already knew I wanted to watch his films, but he just has such an interesting voice. And honestly, I know it's a bit of a cliche. No one does it like him. No one is making films the way David Lynch makes films. There are people who try. There are definitely people who try, but no one who I think succeeds. And I'm saying that having only seen one of his films. But yes, take it from me from someone that was very David Lynch averse for a very long time. You get out what you put in with David. I think if you go to it with an open mind, willingly, you shall receive. Also, Billy Ray Cyrus is in it. That really freaked me out. I don't know why. Just did not expect the worlds of Billy Ray Cyrus and David Lynch to ever overlap. Not in my dizziest daydreams, but I think that would be something that happened ever. And next is Adventure Time. Despite what Kirian will tell you, I fucking love Adventure Time. So Adventure Time is my partner Kirian's absolute favourite show of all time. Like, of all time. Kirian grew up with it. Adventure Time was really the show that got them through. And I've always wanted to watch it. Even before I met Kirian, I've always wanted to watch it. I thought the design of it was beautiful. I really loved that genre of like wholesome show. But what's really interesting about Adventure Time is that it very much <laughs> grows with its audience. It starts out with this very sort of silly, random, weird show. Every episode is sort of on its own. It's just episodic like that. You don't really have to watch it in order. Midway through, or probably even before that, like season three, four, it really starts getting a bit more complex. And there's more nods to like, an overarching plot um, and like proper lore in this crazy strange world. I mean there's like lots of different kingdoms, there's slime kingdom, fire kingdom, ice kingdom, candy kingdom um, and they look gorgeous obviously the visuals are beautiful and stunning um, but then the more it goes on the more you find out about 
the world, what this world is, what it used to be, the sinister forces at play, and the different flashbacks come in, lots of weird things happen, and I think it's a show that is for kids but very much can be dissected and enjoyed by adults. There is so much there, and the creators of it, you can tell, have so much love for it and they put so much into it and it's just absolutely stunning. Again, it's 10 seasons long, but sort of like David Lynch, you will be rewarded if you put in the time and the effort and the finale made me cry. It's just stunning and it's beautiful and I love Marceline with my whole heart. I love Tree Trunks. Tree Trunks is like one of my favourite characters in anything ever. She is a little yellow elephant and she is like perpetually horny and says inappropriate stuff all the time and she has this like southern twang and she's voiced by this little sweet old lady who looks like this. She's an icon. Tree Trunks is just Sorry, the most iconic character. They had an episode in the later seasons where it was just like Tree Trunks' backstory. She's been like married and divorced like three times. Queen, love her. She has the... I just love Tree Trunks so much. And LSP, I mean, I forgot about LSP. How could I? But yeah, if you have the time on your hands to really commit to a show that will reward you for seeing the little details and remembering the little details, absolutely go watch Adventure Time. 100% go for it. And next up, Minari. I just sighed because this film is just like this. It's a sigh. It's like melancholy but also relieving. It's like an expelling of breath, you know, and that can either be a good or a bad thing. It can be like a sigh of relief, of contentment, but also like a beleaguered sigh. It's so many sighs. I mean, what a stupid review, Anna. Basically, Minari, I don't even know how to describe Minari. I think in my letterbox review, I wrote that it was a comforting, warm hug. It was like the smell of your grandma's house. You just, you want it to last forever, but it's so much more beautiful because you know that it won't. And it's wonderful. It's a story of an Asian American family trying to really settle in in Arkansas in the 80s, I believe, um, and they've not got a lot of money, and the dad is really trying hard to make this the American dream, have this big start for them. The mother is really not so sure. Uh, she wants to sort of go back to their roots, and she wants her mother to live with them, and, you know, wants her kids to be connected to family. And it is just such a beautiful film. It's beautifully written, beautifully told. Steven Yeun is incredible in the main role. The kids are also really sweet. I don't like kids, so that that's telling you something. Um, the little boy especially is just adorable. The grandma, incredible. She won an Oscar for Best Supporting Actress. She's insanely good, insanely good. And I was reading up a little bit about it, and this film, Minari, was the director's, like, fifth feature film I believe and he really wrote it as sort of his farewell to the industry because I think he'd had some success before but he really wasn't where he wanted to be and I think he wrote Minari as like his sort of swan song, his goodbye to the industry not thinking it would get made and now it's Oscar winning and that's just so indicative of what that film is. It is about the constant struggle and not thinking you're getting anything back. Oh it's just it's incredible, please watch it, it's beautiful. And that brings us to my number one pick. And if you take anything away from this video, is that you need to watch this film immediately. It is called The Mitchells and the Machines. It is on, Dad, I'm, oh my God, The Hoover. The Hoover, now, now, when I'm talking about my favorite one? Father, The Betrayal. Oh my god. And that's funny because The Mitchell and the Machines is about a daughter and a father who are always fighting and then they sort of reconcile over the course of like the robot apocalypse. So dad, where's our robot apocalypse so that we can reconcile this betrayal? It is the spiritual sequel to The Incredibles that we don't deserve, but we absolutely need. It is so good. I could not think of a film more tailored to me. The main character, Katie, she wants to be a filmmaker, she wants to go to film school, she puts everything she has into getting into film school and she finally gets in and then the robot apocalypse happens and her and her family have to survive. She has a little brother who's really into dinosaurs. Her dad is like very sort of 
practical, crafty, he doesn't understand her like artsy stuff, he's like a man's man, let's go live in the woods, sort of Ron Swanson vibe. And the mum is just like a loving mother, um, and she's trying to bring the family together all the time. And it combines all my favourite elements, it's like a sort of weird, apocalypse, end of the world, action sequence movie, but it's also about family and the importance of family. There's a dog in it, a really ugly pug, and his ugliness is like a feature to the plot, so that's just iconic in every single way. And it's a road trip movie as well, because the apocalypse happens while they're driving Katie to her new college to film school, and they're trying to bond as a family, and they just have to so save the world on the way. It's just an absolute love letter to all of these genres, like the road trip movie, the superhero movie, the apocalypse movie, the action movie. There's also an incredible set piece that involves Furbies. And if you need a film right now that's going to put a smile on your face and also make you cry, because both happened. You know, it breaks your heart and then like stitches it back together for you. Absolutely iconic. And Olivia Coleman voices the villain. So what more do you want? Please go and watch it. The director is someone who worked on Gravity Falls and if you watch the last video in this little series that I'm doing, Gravity Falls is my absolute favourite discovery of like the last couple of months. I think it's such an incredible show. And the director Mitchell and the Machine Mitchell's on the Machines worked quite extensively on Gravity Falls, so it just makes sense that this is right up my street and I will be watching literally everything that anyone who's ever watched from Gravity Falls makes next because they seem to just really have had great people and then the people that made Gravity Falls have gone on to do incredible things. This video has been all kinds of chaotic. I feel like I've said a million words, a million words, um, and hopefully no mice have crept up on me during the course of this video. If you stuck it out to the end, leave me a mouse emoji, go on. I'm fine with the emojis, just not the real thing in my house. But yeah, leave me a mouse emoji if you got to the end of this very chaotic video. And I'm very sorry you've had to sit through all of this and also all of my camera problems. And I'm probably out of focus, but it's how I feel spiritually, so we're gonna go with it. Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I will not take up any more of your time. Father, stop hoovering. Thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you soon with another one. Maybe. I don't know. Who knows at this point. <laughs> Bye.